Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chuck Tabor. I'm the dean of the graduate school. And uh, this is, without doubt, the, my, my favorite thing to do um, in the graduate school, and that's to hear what, what work graduate students are, are, are doing uh, at Stony Brook. Um, we started this series, I think, four years ago now, and it's really been a, just a great success. Um, I'm always amazed at the quality of the research. I shouldn't be amazed, I guess, since it's been happening over and over, but I, I guess I'm a slow learner. I'm always amazed at the, you know, the, the quality of the research that I, that, that's reported, um, the, the exciting work that's being done here at Stony Brook. Um, I, I should also say that our speaker today has, has, uh, has, has gotten this, this, this award um, after competing with a very large number of other students across this campus. This is really quite an exceptional um, uh, honor to, to, to get this, this opportunity to speak. Um, we typically now have uh, you know, somewhere around 60 applications for the slots for each semester across campus. So, and these are all top students. It's not just 60 students, but they're all students whose advisors believe they're worthy of this award. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite an honor. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker's advisor to introduce her. Um, her advisor is Professor Reshit Akchakaya um, from the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Thank you, thank you, Chuck. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jessica Stanton. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, and she'll tell you a very interesting story, and also a very important one. Um, uh, she'll talk about this, this species, passenger pigeon, which um, uh, uh, is important first of all because next year will mark the 100th anniversary of the extinction of the last of, of the species meaning the death of the last known individual of this of the species and um, after 100 years you would think that we would know why this species went extinct well actually it's not the case we really don't know um, except Jessica will tell us today so we'll know <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also important because um, uh, of the parallels with, with current extinction crisis. Um, the, um, um, at, at the time, this was, as, as Jessica will tell you in a moment, uh, probably the most abundant bird species on Earth. And it went extinct in such a short time. Uh, people actually didn't believe uh, such an abundant species can go extinct. And um, interestingly, today there are still people who believe that very abundant species cannot possibly go extinct. You see it in the debates about fisheries, about marine turtles, about species that have been declining quite fast but are still quite abundant. And, and, and so there are, I think, very interesting parallels with the case of the passenger pigeon and there are some very important lessons that, that we can learn. So Jessica will uh, get us started on, on, on these lessons. Thank you. Um, is there a way to dim these front lights? No. Okay. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, but it's, you won't get the drama. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oh, all right, never mind. <laughs> what did you do? Okay, all right, never mind then. Okay, so I'm going to start by reading a short passage. The passenger pigeon was no mere bird. He was a biological storm. He was the lightning that played between two biotic poles of intolerable intensity, the fat of the land and his own zest for living. Yearly, the feathered tempest roared up, down, and across the continent, sucking up the laden fruits of forest and prairie, burning them in a traveling blast of life. Like any other chain reaction, the pigeon could survive no diminution of his own furious intensity. Once the pigeoners had subtracted from his numbers, and once the settlers had chopped gaps in the continuity of his fuel, his flame guttered out with hardly a sputter or even a wisp of smoke. So I'm going to tell you a story today, <clears throat> and it's a story about this bird, the passenger pigeon, but it's also a story about this country and this continent, and what the landscape was, was like on this continent 
before the European settlement, before the, the, um, how we recognize the, the landscape today. But it's also a story about the relationship of people with that continent, with the land, and the relationship with the natural resources and how they use the natural resources available to them. So I'm going to start off by um, just explaining my overall objectives, uh, objectives for why I wanted to look at the species. And first of all, I just wanted to unravel some of the mystery of how this once very common species was lost. And because even, um, you know, you read about it and it's like, why did the passenger pigeon go extinct? And some people say one thing and other people say another thing. And no one's really looked at it quantitatively. And I like to look at things quantitatively, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to just put this model together and see what it says? Um, but I also think that it's important, um, as Rashid mentioned, for uh, using the species as a case study for, for present-day conservation. And what lessons can we learn from this extinction event that might help us inform um, current species extinction and prevent it? So just a little bit about the passenger pigeon. Um, it was extremely abundant and wide-ranging. And when I say extremely abundant, I mean it was ridiculously abundant. Um, you hear these stories where people were writing accounts of um, their experiencing witnessing this, this bird, and they would tell these stories about flocks that would blacken the sky, and these flocks that would roll in and they would just suck up everything, um, you know, every nut, grain, fruit, and just leave a wasteland. And even as the people were, um, were writing down these accounts of what they had witnessed, they didn't even believe what they were writing themselves. So you have quotes like this. Um, there flew over all the towns and our plantations so many flocks of doves, each flock containing many thousands, and some so many that they obscured the light, that it passeth credit. So even as these people were writing it, they're just like, no one's going to believe this. So they, they formed these large um, nomadic nesting colonies. And this map that I'm showing here, so the, um, the solid line shows the extent of their occurrence. And this dotted line in the middle shows the extent of their breeding range. And when I say that they formed um, nomadic nesting colonies, what I mean is that they didn't, within this breeding range, they didn't occupy the entire range every year they would form up into these large flocks, and those flocks would move around the landscape, and they were searching for this ephemeral resource. So within these large colonies, they would form monogamous pairs, and the pair would build a nest, and they would lay just a single egg. So this is a picture of an actual passenger pigeon, and this is a picture of an, an, a nest with a single egg in it, and this is from the passenger pigeon's closest living relative, which is a band-tailed pigeon, which is very similar in that it also just lays a single egg. But the band-tailed pigeon will nest multiple times in, in one season, whereas the passenger pigeon, it's believed they did not. They formed up the large colony, they laid their one egg, and that was it. So this ephemeral resource that they relied on is tree mast. So this word uh, mast, you might not be familiar with it, and it just refers to uh, the nuts of a forest tree. So um, beech nuts were their primary food source, but they also ate chestnuts, hickory, and oak nuts, which are also called acorns. Um, and these, this word mast can also refer to this ecological phenomenon where forest trees will synchronize their reproduction, and they will put out a large amount of nuts all at one time over a fairly large geographic space, but it'll be kind of, it'll be sort of isolated. So that was this ephemeral resource that these colonies relied on. So they would travel the, the landscape searching for where the trees were masting, um, and then that's where they would set up their colony, because it was the only place where there would be a concentrated enough resource for them to have a successful colony. The population declined um, throughout the 1800s, and starting in the later half of the 19th century, people started to notice that it seemed like the flocks were smaller. Um, it seemed like the colonies were harder to find. Um, and it's not known exactly how many there were at any point in time, um, but it's thought that they were extinct in the wild by 1900. The last um, credible uh, 
account was sometime around 1890, early, mid-1890s, I think. And so by the 1900s, they, would ha they had these uh, contests where they said, you know, anyone bring us proof that there's still wild pigeons in the land, and these rewards went unclaimed. So the last individual um, died in captivity in 1914. Her name was Martha. And she, was, um, she had been in captivity for around 17 years, and it's thought that she was probably 20 to 25 years old. So many people assume that overharvest was the primary driver of extinction. And you hear stories, why did the passenger pigeon go extinct? They were hunted to extinction. And people, um, they were hunted um, in fairly large numbers. Um, but some people also contend that there might, be, there might have been other reasons. Um, but they were, uh, they were a very important um, resource. They, for a long time, they were utilized by Native Americans and the frontier settlers. And they would be a very important source of food to get the settlers and the Native Americans through the winter. And what they would do is, when a colony was located, uh, particularly the Native Americans, particularly the Seneca, Seneca Indians, would move their uh, camps to the edges of the colonies, and they would wait till a very particular moment um, to go in and do this harvesting. And they would wait until the, the pairs laid their eggs and raised the chicks up, and they would wait until the chicks were almost ready to fledge, almost ready to leave the nest. And then they would come in, and they would primarily uh, hunt the, these young nestlings, mostly because they were easy to catch. But they also had respect for the adults. Um, so uh, they would, they would uh, harvest all these birds, and they would preserve them either by salting them, drying them, um, uh, packing them in oil. The settlers would actually render the fat from these little nestlings, and they would use it as uh, a substitute for like lard or, um, or a, like a butter. Um, they would use the feathers for, for bedding. So they were a really important natural resource. Uh, with the expansion of the railroads um, around the mid-1800s, um, it was finally then economically feasible to set up a commercial market in passenger pigeons because now there was a way to transport the pigeons from the nesting colonies back into the high population centers like Chicago, New York. Um, and they would also transport live birds um, to use in uh, hunting um, and in like practice shooting. So when you hear about the, the clay pigeons that they use for skeet shooting, it's called a pigeon because they used to release passenger pigeons and shoot at them. Then when they went extinct, they had to find a substitute and they used this little clay disc. Uh, the telegraph also allowed for coordination between the shippers, the trappers, and the dealers. And the railroad um, companies were very interested in um, making, because they were making a lot of money from the transporta transportation of these, of these birds, um, they would send out scouts to locate the nesting colonies. And then when they found the nesting colonies, they would report back um, via telegraph and um, inform the trappers and the hunters where they could find them. So there's uh, some debate over the exact number of birds that were harvested. Um, and just like then as it is today, there was people on both sides of the issue. And so you had people who were pro-regulation who would tend to overestimate um, the numbers. And they would throw out these very large numbers and say, you're taking this many birds a year. And then there was people who were against regulation who would say, no, no, we're not taking that many. So it's not really clear exactly how many, but you can look at the shipping records. And the best estimates, the, the numbers that kind of keep coming up again and again is seeming credible as one to two million birds a year at the peak harvest. Oh, I should also say that this picture, um, you might notice that these, these carcasses that are hanging seem a little bit large for pigeons. Um, so uh, W.B. Mershon was a pigeon hunter and he had a, this rail car um, these birds in this picture are actually waterfowl, so they're mostly geese and swans. Um, I couldn't find a picture of him with his pigeons, but he was an actual pigeoner. Okay, so along with this hunting, there was also incredible changes going on in the landscape. So I'm going to play just this brief 
uh, video that shows the change in human population density through time. So if you watch the um, North American continent, you can see that it, it starts off on the coast and it starts spreading westward. And beginning in the 1800s, it starts changing very rapidly. And right around the middle of the century, it just explodes. So along with this advance of the human settlement um, came lots of changes to the landscape. So these maps here show um, changes in virgin forest. So this is, um, you know, 1620, this was con considered sort of a baseline of um, what the, the continent looked like around that time, and the Stark is all um, forested area. By 1850, um, it was starting to be fragmented, and by um, the early part of the 20th century, uh, the virgin forests were virtually gone. So these maps here are um, from the 1880 census, as part of the US census. This is about um, two decades before the Forest Service. Um, the, the US census commissioned a study in um, what is the timber resources of the nation. And so um, the person conducting the study drew up these maps um, for each state, and this, I'm just showing Wisconsin and Michigan um, just to illustrate because these two states were both very important for passenger pigeons. And even, in, even at this time, um, all of this brown that he's showing is land that had been harvested over. So the way that I'm going to try to answer these questions is through models. Um, so there's this famous quote that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, so if all models are wrong, why do we do them? And primarily, it's because we can, we can do two main things with models. We can either try to make predictions about what's going to happen in the future, or we can use models to try to understand the dynamics of a system. So just a recent example of a particularly useful model, um, here is the modeled paths of Hurricane Sandy. Um, you know, when it was still way down here, all of these different models were predicting that it was going to shoot up the East Coast and then turn at kind of a funny angle and then head straight towards New York and New Jersey. And that's exactly what happened. And because of these models, um, people had a fair amount of advanced warning in order to ready themselves for this storm that was coming. So I went about um, my first, so I conducted the study with a series of models. My first model was to model habitat. So the way that I did that is um, this is a, a standard method of trying to model habitat, and it's called a um, species distribution model or an ecological niche model. And what you do is you have occurrence locations, and you try to associate those occurrence locations with a set of environmental predictor variables. And it's, it's a correlation type study, and, but what it'll tell you is it'll give you kind of a um, an estimate of the suitability of, of each location in the landscape. So I used a program called Maxent to do this. And the occurrence locations I used um, came from two main sources. One, um, these witness accounts. So uh, as people were traveling around in the landscape during that period of time, they would um, often keep diaries, write into newspapers, um, you know, write letters to relatives. And they would, you know, they might happen to mention, you know, we were traveling along and we were in this county and we were, you know, 20 miles north of this river and we encountered a large colony of nesting pigeons. And so a lot of these, uh, a lot of these eyewitness accounts are um, recorded in this 1955 book by Shorger called The Passenger Pigeon. And also, in uh, early editions of ornithological journals like the Auk and the Wilson Bulletin. So I have uh, 52 of these uh, eyewitness accounts where the location descriptions were enough to kind of throw a point on a map. And I also used museum specimen collections. So these were um, museum specimens that were collected. And I used, um, because I wanted to model the breeding habitat, 
I just used specimens that were collected during the breeding season. So I have another additional 30 records. And the, the stars here are the museum specimens, and the purple dots are the eyewitness accounts. And I associated those <coughs> occurrence locations with um, these predictor variables, and all of the predictor variables are in some way related to uh, the distribution of um, the food resources that the birds depended on. So this is what my habitat model looks like. And if I flip back over to the, the sketch that was before, and these are in um, different projections, so they, they look a little different, but um, they're pretty close. You have the same kind of general idea in, in this little lobe that comes down over here. So that's that. OK, so now I have a, kind of a baseline um, what would the habitat have been like before settlement? And so now I need to take into account how that uh, settlement would have impacted the amount of habitat available to the birds. So I used uh, this project that comes out of the Netherlands, um, which is very cool, and it's called the Hyde. And what they do is they, um, they model for the entire globe um, going way back in history, all the way to the present day, um, they model the fraction of, so they do the population density, that was the video I showed earlier, but they also do the fraction of each land unit, so the, the, uh, each um, unit of land area on the globe, um, the fraction of that that's in cropland and grassland. And they do this through a spatial allocation algorithm based on their population density studies, and then they take into account the available technology, um, the suitability of the land for agriculture, so things like soil type, slope, distance to water, and also the climate in, in each area. So I'm just going to flip through these really quick, um, going for each decade. So starting from um, in 1800, more or, le more or less, this looks like my baseline habitat suitability model. And then as I move along forward, um, the land that gets converted to cropland or grassland is going to get um, subtracted from the landscape. So you can see by 1800, the land is, um, the available habitat area is fairly reduced and highly fragmented. And this represents an overall decrease of about 50%. And I have this um, represented in terms of the carrying capacity. So this is my estimate of how many birds the landscapes could support at each, in each year. And I have this just in terms of, um, just in terms of the females, because I'm only modeling uh, females in my, in my population model. So I mentioned before about how they don't really evenly use the landscape. They're chasing after this ephemeral resource in terms of the, the trees that are masting. So the way that I modeled this was I would throw down a random point and I, within the breeding range. And I would draw a circle around that point. This is a 250-kilometer um, buffer. And I would say, OK, that point, that within that buffer is in my model, this is going to be the mast area. This is going to be the area that, of the landscape that's, that has this very high density, high quality resource in this one year. And so I would upweight the habitat suitability of within that buffer and downweight the rest of the landscape. And then I would throw down another point for the next year, and another point for the next year, and another point for the next year. So what this ends up looking like is what this does is, as you just go from one year to the next, it adds this variability to the carrying capacity. So what happens to the population when they're above the carrying capacity is their reproduction is reduced. And when they're below the carrying capacity, um, they're, they're able to reproduce more. So it's not, um, it's not like if they go above their carrying capacity, they just die. Um, they just have a, a bad reproduction year. 
So um, this adds this level of variability, but I didn't want to say like, okay, since I don't know in any given year what, the, um, what this trajectory looked like through time, I would repeat it again and again and again and again. So I repeated this um, a thousand times so that I can get kind of an average um, runs of, of what this trajectory would have looked like through time. Now, if we take into account that at the same time, the habitat is also being reduced and fragmented, like I showed, then the effect that this has is now if I throw down my random point in the same way that I just described, um, and I draw that my buffer around it, it might be that what would have been a high mast year happens to land in an area where the forest has been reduced or fragmented. So the effect that this is going to have is you're still going to get this variability through time, but now it's going to um, be decreasing with the total um, habitat available at each time step. And I, again, I would replicate this again and again and again. So I have 1,000 replicates, replicates of this um, process with the declining habitat. But what I'm really interested in is not what happened to the habitat, but what happened to the population. So I address this through a population model. So this is um, just kind of a cartoon that describes the general construct of how I build these models. And this is called the matrix model. It's a really common way of modeling populations. And I start off with kind of two pools or two stages of individuals. And individuals can be either juveniles or adults. And these arrows represent the transitions between these two pools. So these arrows here, this arrow here is survival. So the juveniles survive from one year to the next and become adults. And because the adults are long lived, they have their own survival rate where they can survive and kind of stay adults from one year to the next. Now these other arrows are reproduction. So this, this arrow represents the reproduction of adults. So this is the, the rate that adults add new individuals to the population. And the juveniles have a reproduction value as well because um, they do reproduce in their first year. So if you take all of these rates and pools together, um, this is my population model, and this is going to tell me the population size through time. So now I can add things. I can add effects to this model, like hunting or habitat loss, and ask questions like, how does this affect my model? So I created a simulated population model. Um, the parameters, so the, the rates that are described here and the effect sizes that I add to my model are, as much as I can, they come from historical records of what the actual passenger pigeons um, were like. But for some of these parameters, there's just no information available. So for some parameters, I had to go to uh, their closest living relatives. So I showed that picture before of the band-tailed pigeon nest, and it's one egg. And in a lot of ways, the band-tailed pigeon um, biologically is very similar to a passenger pigeon. So for some of the parameters, I had to borrow um, parameters from, from their own biology. So I modeled the population from 1800 to 1900. I also did a 20-year, um, what's called a warm-up, um, because in the first, when you first start running a model, you can get sort of weird things happening. So I have kind of this warm-up period where I let the model run and calibrate, and then I start counting the results once it hits 1800. And I did the model with stochastic replicated trajectories. And what that means is, so this would be one trajectory through time. So this is one output of the model. And, but I don't know if, if this is really what happened because it might have looked something like that. Or it might have looked something like that. So I repeat this many, many, many times, the same way I did with the, um, with the habitat through time. And I did this with 1,000 replicates. So there's also all of these parameters. Every one of my parameters that go into the model are, are very uncertain. And I just I don't know exact values for, for each parameter. So I have, I have all these questions where I'm not sure exactly um, what the right parameter should be. So I conducted what's called a global sensitivity analysis. 
So if I have two parameters, um, this is just an example. So for instance, um, population growth rate and adult reproductive rate. And I have, I don't know what the exact value of each of these parameters is, but I have a, a good idea of a general bounding. So I have an estimate for an absolute lowest value and an absolute highest value. And, I th and I'm pretty confident that the true value is somewhere in these bounds. So then if I have a second parameter, and again I have these bounds that I, I think the true value is somewhere in here, and I have a lower estimate and an upper estimate, that creates this range of uncertainty. So if I divide that up and then sample within this, and I'm just showing this in two dimensions, but this would go out into multiple dimensions, and I sample within this parameter space, and I generate 500 models to kind of cover uh, the range of uncertainty. So now I can start exploring uh, these impact factors that I'm interested in. So uh, for one is commercial, this commercial market harvest. So this commercial harvest is in addition to background harvest levels. So I'm not, um, I'm not testing the effects of um, this sort of subsistence level harvesting that went on. Um, what I'm really interested in is, is in knowing what was the impact of just the commercial level of harvest that would have been in addition to um, locals using it, using those species. So this um, in my model begins in the year 1850, and it scales with population abundance. So when the population abundance is high, the harvest is, is very high, and when the population harvest is low, um, the harvest rate decreases, and that's to represent that once, um, once the birds, once their population levels fell very low, there wouldn't have been as much market incentive to go out and hunt them. So I have uncertainty bounds on, um, on the commercial market harvest, and I, I modeled it as between 100,000 a year or and 10 million a year. So my, my best estimate of one to two million is you know, kind of in the middle somewhere and I have a lower bound and an upper bound. So I'm gonna test this full range. So the, the second impact factor that I wanna look at is habitat loss. So as the land is converted to agriculture or pasture, it reduces the carrying capacity as I showed before. And I have the uncertainty bounds that I'm testing here is this factor that I call coloniality. So as the, um, as the birds are kind of chasing that mast around, I can model that as either, as how much of the, how much of the total population is gonna be dependent on that mast and how many um, birds might be either forming small colonies elsewhere or nesting as individual pairs, which they are reported to do. So they would kind of have this one really large colony and then they would be scattered around in the rest of the landscape, a few birds here and there. So this coloniality factor, the effect that it has basically is it, re it increases, as you increase the coloniality, you increase um, how much that variability in the year-to-year -year carrying capacity is. And the third factor that I'm looking at is the probability of a failed colony. So because this hunting mostly took place while the birds were trying to nest, and they didn't always respect the birds um, in terms of letting them finish their nesting before they ran in and started um, harvesting and collecting birds, a lot of times uh, the colonies would be so disrupted that they would um, be abandoned or large portions of the colony would be abandoned and there would be little to no reproduction going on that year. So I modeled this as 70% um, of the juvenile birds being lost in a given year when there's this failed colony. Um, this begins in the year 1850 with the commercial harvest and the bounds, the uncertainty bounds on, on this parameter are there's either on average one, two, or three of these events per decade. So I explore all of these, these various impacts 
um, by doing every combination of them. So there's either commercial harvest, yes or no, habitat loss, yes or no, or these three levels of um, probability of a failed colony. So within each of these um, combinations, I have my, those 500 models. So there's 6,000 models in total and 1,000 replicates of each model, or 1,000 replicates within each model. So this is what the results of this look like. Um, so here's my, my 12 combinations. And um, here I have the, this probability of colony failure, so either once a decade, twice a decade, or three times a decade. And um, the habitat loss or no habitat loss is represented by either green or red. So red is, is habitat loss, green is no habitat loss. And the darker color um, is the commercial harvest. And the uncertainty bounds on this are this is one standard deviation across those 500 models. So the statistic that I'm presenting here is expected population decline. So this is just um, how much, how low at any point in the in the hundred year simulation, how low is the population expected to go at any point relative to the initial abundance. So this right here, this would be um, this 40 to 50 percent decline. That just means that if I'm starting off with 600 million females, because um, remember my model is female only, if I'm starting off that at some point in time it drops to around 300 million. It's still a lot of birds. So um, this is you know fairly obvious. <laughs> so if you look at this bar here, this is where I'm. Uh, I have all of my impact factors working in my model, and you know, predictably, you would expect a higher percent decline. Whereas here, I have, um, you know, kind of this is I'm going pretty easy on the birds, and they have a lower expected decline. But what I'm really interested in is what is the relative effect of each of these factors. So if we looked at a, par a paired comparison. Um, between, so these are the same 500 models, and the only thing that's different between them is it, there's either no harvest or harvest. So now if we look at the expected decline, this is just a histogram. You can see that um, the expected harvest increases the expected decline by about 7%. If we look at the effect of colony failure, so again with these paired comparisons, um, going from the lowest probability to the highest probability increases the expected decline by about 10%. But if we look at habitat loss, this increases the expected decline going from no habitat loss to habitat loss by about 20%. So the largest single effect is habitat loss. So Trying to make this relevant to conservation today, I wanted to look at uh, the IUCN Red List criteria. So the IUCN is the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and they maintain a set of criteria with which to evaluate species um, for how at risk of extinction they are. And you can categorize species into these different threat levels. So, um, so they look at all species and either, either they're not evaluated or all of these are evaluated. And then they say, okay, is there enough data to even, um, you know, put a species into a category? And if there's not enough data, then it gets this, this data deficient. So then all of these are the ones that there's enough data to at least evaluate them. So um, then they can be either least concern or near threatened which would be not considered um, threatened, but this near threatened is sort of a, um, you know, keep an eye on this species. And then within the threatened categories, there's a vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered um, before they go to extinct in the wild or extinct. So um, just as a caveat, this is the, this is the part of my, of my research that I'm still really working on. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the results of one model um, remember, I have 6,000, so I still have a lot more to look at. Um, but in general, what this looks like is, so I'm interested in, as each of these 
trajectories that I'm creating um, decline? At what point do they pass through these different threat categories on their way to extinction? So, for example, if I just look at this one possible trajectory, so this is just one trajectory, and, and I can kind of compare it to, um, you know, in this year the commercial hunting begins, and, you know, that sort of marks the beginning of this precipitous decline, and in this year was the last year that they had a very large harvest, and then the final wild record. So in this one modeled trajectory, it seems kind of plausible that that might have been something like what actually happened. And then if I just zoom in on those last, um, those last few years towards extinction, and then, and then um, apply the, the IUCN red list criteria, I can see in what year, um, if you had sort of jumped in, into a conservation time machine and gone back in time and say in the year um, 1882, if I had evaluated the species against the IUCN red list criteria, I would have come up with a vulnerable rating. And then likewise, in each year, um, this is the rating that, that the species would have received. So this is just, this is only 100 replicates of one model. And so um, this, is, this is very tenuous. I'm not saying this is, this is exactly what happened. This is um, just what I'm looking at now. And so the way that you look at this is, is each of these lines is one trajectory. So each band going across this way. And here I have my threat categories. And so you can see for this one model that as once, the, once you get into around 1860 or so, they all kind of, they all go in, every model goes into a critically endangered um, threat category. And there was a good amount of time with which had people been able to act, they would have probably had a, a fair amount of time in order to recognize that the species was in danger and do something about it. So again, this is only one model out of my 6,000, so um, this work in progress. Okay, so in summary, um, it's likely that multiple factors uh, contributed to the fate of the species. So it was the commercial hunting, it was the habitat loss, it was the fact that they relied on this um, ephemeral resource that added this variability year to year. It's also possible that if the harvest had just been better managed, it might not have prevented extinction, but it probably wouldn't have been so rapid. I personally think that the, the land use would have caught up to the bird eventually, um, but they might not have gone extinct so quickly um, had there just been more management. And for species today, um, for, for species that are facing multiple threats, even if they're common and abundant, more frequent evaluation or monitoring might be warranted. And with that, I would like to thank the people who helped me and thank all of you for listening and take any questions.